past distributions of glaciers, and the causes. The mass of ice on our Earth is constantly changing, and these changes fluctuate from the day scale to the millions of years scale. However, at the present, glaciers and ice sheets cover about 10% of our Earth's surface, but it's not always been like that. Let's end this video very briefly highlight the main glaciations in the past, their extent, and what controls the glaciations. Although it might sound wrong, but right now we are in an ice age stage on our planet. However, the extent of the glaciation was different, and the peak extension of the glaciers in our last period of glaciations was three times more than right now, about 30-35% of the planet was covered with the ice sheets. The ice reached areas such as modern New York and more south of Moscow. During the last hundreds of millions of years, the Earth swings between periods of high average glacier ice cover, and we call it ice house conditions on the Earth, to the little or no ice cover, we hold greenhouse conditions. And within these fluctuations within ice houses, we have periods of more ice cover and then slight retreat, and again and again, constantly fluctuating. Similar in the greenhouse or warmer periods, we have periods when there's no ice at all, or just some remnants of the ice caps on the high peaks of mountains. Thus, the glaciers adjusting to shifts in environmental condition. Currently, we are in the ice house state. We observe the thick ice sheets on the poles of our planet, and the numerous valley glaciers in the high mountains. This current period began about 34 million years ago, at the beginning of the late Cenozoic period, since which time ice sheets and glaciers have spread and melted away, but never totally disappeared. And we look even deeper in the past. Before that period, before late Cenozoic, Earth experienced a long greenhouse period. There was not much ice, it was totally absent at that time. Prior to this period, there was a greenhouse dominating our planet. Glaciers was very small or absent at all. And if we looked further into the past, the previous periods of long-term glaciation were during the Permian Carboniferous period, 326 till 267 million years ago, in the late Devonian to early Carboniferous period, 361 to 349 million years ago, and the late Ordovician period, 445 to 443 million years ago. All the three glaciations occur when parts of the supercontinent of Gondwana occupied the South Pole region. We know that the two most severe ice house events, or the times of the most glaciation, occurred during the Proterozoic period, about 2.3-2.2 billion years ago, and 740 to 360 million years ago. Glaciers extended so far till the equator, and the global temperature was very low, below zero. Ice wasn't available so much in a liquid form at that time. Scientists study those periods and pay big attention to this, not just because it was so cold and dramatic, but also because it caused dramatic changes in evolution of the life on our planet and oxygen levels in our atmosphere. So let's talk in details more what controls these periods of severe glaciation and greenhouse periods in between. Although you might think there will be one factor that affects it, it's actually not so simple like everything in our solar system. Many factors in the combination affecting the extent of glaciation at a particular time. If you look on a very long period of time, for example, 1 billion years time scale, we see the increase in solar luminosity and the amount of short-wave radiation reaching the Earth, so amount of heat coming towards our Earth. Thus, 4 billion years ago, solar output was only 75% of its present value. You might say it explains why we have more severe glaciation back in the time. However, during that time, the life still sustained on our planet, and now we know the greenhouse effect of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere play a role in it. Now people accept the idea about the global climate, which is controlled by concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and how it's influenced the near-surface heat and energy balance. Let's first talk how the carbon dioxide cycle affects the heat around our planet. 
If you look in the periods of tens of hundreds of millions of years, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere are influenced by tectonic processes on our planet. Thus, in the previous video we talked, the carbon is removed from the atmosphere by weathering and is trapped in the bottom of the ocean as a sedimentary rocks, before eventually it will be released into the atmosphere by volcanic eruption due to the plate tectonics. There's a period on our planet when the, a lot of volcanic eruption, lava flows occurring, and the carbon dioxide concentration increasing. In the same time, it's all superimposed by the biological production and human activity, of course. Scientists suggested that the low atmospheric carbon dioxide levels in the ice house conditions, although times when we have a lot of glaciation on our planet, are favored by the existence of supercontinent and low volcanic activity. When we have a big supercontinent bound together, there is normal collision happening and active mountain building, and you don't observe so many volcano eruption like, for example, we see right now on our planet. Thus, carbon dioxide greenhouse conditions are favored by continental rifting and collision of the continents. Thus, science to show that in permacarboniferous and less cenozoic glaciations, there was a low levels of the atmospheric carbon dioxide. When, for example, Mesozoic and early Cenozoic warm intervals were followed by high levels of carbon dioxide, a lot of volcanic eruptions. However, even here we have some exceptions, so other, other factors must be causing glaciations as well. Thus, the Ardovician glaciation, which was quite localized at the time, occurred when the atmospheric carbon dioxide was 10 times higher than now. Another, the most speculated among scientists, period. It's the ice greenhouse climate transition in Proterozoic. Cryogenian ice house was initiated to respond to carbon dioxide, according to some, and it's followed by the breakup of the supercontinent of Rodinia. At the peak of that, the glaciation was so extreme that at the time when the Earth was locked into the snowball Earth, because the average temperature on the planet was sub-zero, the Earth kind of locked itself with uninterrupted ice cover all over, and because of that, the short waves radiation from the Sun were reflected from its surface higher and more than before, and it's caused further cooling. We are lucky we escaped that period, and scientists suggested there should be an enormous amount of carbon dioxide brought to the atmosphere by thousands of years of outgazing due to the tectonic movements to come back to the greenhouse conditions. Still, among the scientists, it's the most debatable model, constantly people proposing new ideas why and how it's happened, so there are plenty of work for researchers, for now. And of course, we know that the climate is also superimposed by distribution of continents, mountain chains, and sea passages, which affect the distribution of the atmospheric masses circulating the heat around the planet. Good examples will be the rising and uplift of Tibetan Plateau, the Himalaya, and Western Cordillera in North and South America, which driven the glaciation in the mid Cenozoic times. Another classical example is the Antarctica. The tectonic deepening of the direct passage between Antarctica Peninsula and South America around 34 30 million years ago caused the formation of Antarctic circumpolar current which reduced the heat flux arriving there, locking Antarctica in the very cold conditions. If you look in the past, it's much harder to understand the glaciations of the past. We know when they occur approximately, but we don't know the fluctuations within. However, for the last one, late Cenozoic one, we know more, and there's a lot of paleoclimate data, which shows good curves of fluctuations, increase in glaciation and then retreat, increase, and decrease, increase, and decrease. Thus, for the last two million years, ice cores, foraminifera data, data from the bottom of the ocean, also some other paleoclimate proxies, shows this decrease and increase in temperature and, of course, of glaciations. Also, glaciologists finding evidence in landforms, landmarks, of past fluctuation of glaciations. In the last two million years, people noticed that this glacial maximum extent of the ice and interglacial my warmer period with full or partial retreat of the glaciers and melt linked to the cyclical changes in the Earth's orbit around the Sun. However, this 
interrelations is not fully understood and could be a little bit more complicated, but it's quite pronounced. We we'll call them Milankovitch cycles, and let's in detail look at them closer. The first is the shape or eccentricity of the Earth's orbit fluctuates. It fluctuates from more elliptical one and become then more less elliptical, more circle, every hundred thousand years. Second one, it's the change of the tilt, we call it obliquity of the Earth's axis relative to the orbital plane, and this fluctuation more frequent every 41,000 years. And the third is direction of the tilt of the Earth's axis relative to the distant star, and this fluctuation occurs every 23,000 years. We call it precession. It also alters the timing of the seasons on our planet. If we put it all together, these cyclists cause variation in the amount of the solar radiation coming towards the surface of our Earth, and this four the heat arriving to our Earth affected, and is a fundamental part of the climate control on our planet. As a result, equator to pole isolation gradients influence atmospheric circulation and the moisture movement towards high latitudes. From here you can imagine all the system on our planet react. Atmosphere, oceans, hydrology cycle, vegetation, growth and decline of glaciers and ice sheets. And as a result, ice sheets and glaciers respond to this and they become locked into the system. So there could be, in the same time, a consequence of this change in the climate system, or they might cause some climate change, kind of feedback and lock the system more. Therefore, you can understand, it's a very hard topic to understand and figure out for scientists, especially the further in the past we look. I hope this video helped you understand a little bit more about glaciations in the past, the main causes of it, and I will see you in next videos when we talk more in detail about recent glaciation, its causes, and the potential future.